New tonight, throughout the past year, riots fueled by racial tensions have erupted. However, here in Tulsa, protests stayed peaceful despite lasting for weeks. Channel 8's Marine Words has a look at how and why leaders here chose peace. Only on 8, how they work to avoid any violence. Either I live in fear or I don't. It's the way I live my life. I can't live in fear. We are not by ourselves. There was a clear no, path for Mark Lewis, no, and he made sure he stayed on it. I personally got a lot of slack because they felt like our protests were really watered down. So, um, yeah, it's a lot of behind the scenes <laughs> that goes with this stuff. Yeah. We want to make sure that the community is aware. Weekly marches were planned out in meetings like this one. Lewis says they chose to march because during a rally, things could get out of hand. And we're dealing with a lot of grieving hearts. So when you're dealing with a lot of green hearts, we don't need opportunist people there to be angry and to throw things. And we, we tell them that up front. Andre Harris, one Jim of those grieving up. hearts, is still to this day advocating for peace. Even after major players who you see speaking at rallies across the country wanted to step in. Maureen, I've always felt that I was an intelligent man, a man of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Because not only do I study my word, but I'm a prayer man. But I knew that anger and rage was something that Bob Bates and those um, at the sheriff's office do, not Mr. Harris. I wouldn't want anybody to wake up and see what I saw this morning. Even moments after his brother died, Andre spoke to us. Can I speak? Yeah. Eyewitness said that when he went to the ground, when they tackled him, he went to the ground. He was literally on the ground when they shot him. Yeah, bro! Shut the f up! Oh God! Oh, he shot me out of you! He shot me there! His message, the same then as it is now, one of faith and justice. So I didn't want it. I didn't want the, 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 all the publicity to actually take any attention off of my brother <clears throat> had been shot by a 73-year-old reserve deputy that paid to play. Both men saying they made a conscious decision to choose peace because a little under 100 years ago, Tulsa was anything but peaceful. This is a part of our history here. If you live here, this is a part of our history and it needs to be talked about. When you talk about 1921, you gotta talk about Tulsa, Oklahoma. In 1921, 35 city blocks were destroyed. 600 people injured, another 300 killed during the Tulsa race riot. And what was once considered one of the most affluent African-American communities in the country wiped away. Not only did people lose their homes and their livelihoods through the loss of their businesses, they lost their lives. And that was horrific. Dr. Jocelyn Payne with the John Hope Franklin Center for Reconciliation says even though the riot lasted less than a day in 1921, its impact is still felt today. The aftermath of the race riot is um, visible and probably visceral throughout this community. Payne says insurance payments were never received. People fled Tulsa, families were left struggling. That's still happening. She says you can spot it in the rundown homes, the abandoned buildings, and the lesson that was passed down for generations, survive, don't thrive. And I can understand that. I can understand why people want to just disrupt things because their life is disrupted and they feel like they're not heard. Lewis says he met with people to make sure they knew someone was listening. It gave them hope. You know, I mean, I think we can see now the tone of the community and all over Tulsa, they're feeling as if that my voice, my, my, my voice matters now. Harris sticking to his message about faith and promising me one thing. Maureen, we're, we're, we're at a time now in life, in this world, where things are about to change. Change starting with perception. This is the perception we get on TV is that we're all thugs walking around with our pants hanging. But I'm sitting here today with a suit on, bow tie, and a Bible. And Lewis hoping a new lesson will be passed down. You count. You're sitting in your chair. You matter. Mark Lewis Help has me. a path. And right now, it's just beginning. Help me. Tulsa's Channel 8. Help me.
High school students in Tulsa Public Schools are required to learn about the race riot. If you'd like to learn more about it yourself, there's a whole bunch of information at the Greenwood Cultural Center. We've got it all posted on the links at K2L.com. This is Tulsa's Channel 8 at 6. Your local news starts now. We're starting with breaking news tonight. A federal jury has reached a verdict in the trial involving sexual assault allegations at the Tulsa County Jail. It involves a woman who claims a detention officer sexually assaulted her while she was in the jail. Channel 8's Maureen Wirtz has been covering the case since the beginning. She just walked out of that courtroom with what's decided. Maureen. Oh, Kristen, a huge day here at the federal courthouse after jurors ruled in favor of the young woman here. Now, by ruling in her favor, they are saying that both Stanley Glanz and the Tulsa County Sheriff's Office deliberately violated her civil rights, meaning in deliberately indifferent. Now, when they housed her in the medical unit in the jail, that's where she says she was raped and sexually assaulted by a detention officer. The jury awarded her $25,000. We were able to talk with her lawyers for the first time after court today, and it's more than six years ago to the day when she said those sexual assaults started happening. And I can't remember the first time, uh, the last time this has happened in Oklahoma, but uh, we just proved that the sheriff of Tulsa County was personally liable due to his deliberate indifference and reckless disregard for the rights of individuals at the jail. So is this a victory? You better believe it. But it's only the first step in a lot of different steps to, to make things right here in Tulsa County. Uh, Kristen, we've been covering this case for nine days now. I've filled out four notebooks, just full of notes. And you can imagine that that might seem like a lot, but the amount of evidence that the jury had to go through was quite a bit, including testimony and documents. But they were able to return that verdict today. But we've broken down the facts for you, just the basic evidence in this case. The first part of evidence where the girls were housed in the jail was partially blocked off from view. According to testimony, there were no cameras in the medical unit and curtains partially blocked windows in cells and on the doors. Evidence number two, Seth Bowers pled the fifth when asked multiple times if he had sex with the plaintiff. The judge tells the jury they can interpret that as truthful answers to the questions, such as if he exposed himself to her, if they had oral sex, if he knew her would incriminate him. Evidence number three, the Tulsa County Sheriff's Office investigated the alleged sexual assault in May of 2010. The Tulsa County Sheriff's Office says they interviewed inmates and the plaintiff. At first, she told investigators nothing happened, but that Bowers watched her in the shower, groped her, and exposed himself to her. At the end of the recorded interview, she was told not to talk to anyone about it. The investigator testified the interview happened at the jail and she was 17 at the time. Evidence number four, Medical logs and records provided by the defense showed errors in documenting female juvenile inmates. According to testimony, it was busy in the medical unit, and there are a couple different ways to keep track of inmates and detention officers. Evidence number five, people working in the medical unit testified that they didn't know the investigation happened until much later. Glanz didn't include the 2010 investigation when talking to the DOJ about sexual assaults at the jail. Now, that was just the basic facts to this case, but for you, we've got all of the details. We've been covering this again for nine days now. That includes testimony from former Sheriff Stanley Glanz and testimony from the plaintiff and also acting Sheriff Michelle Robinette. That's all on our website for you. That's KTUL.com. Live downtown, Maureen Wirtz, Tulsa's Channel 8. Thank you, Maureen. The lawsuit was first filed in December 2011. Channel 8 wanted to know how much the county has paid to the law firm Brewster and DeAngelis. In an open records request, Channel 8 found that since July of 2012 until December of 2015, the county has paid $872,964.78. There are several cases that the law firm is working on with the county. The last post I got from him, it says, Hey, little bro, I'm so proud of you. You are truly my hero. Happy birthday. I love you, Eric. And then I said, I love you too, champ. Keep God first. And then he said, I'm on my way home now. Is that another one? Or is that it? That's it. Sweet, that's a nice gun, man. It's not a Ruger, though. It's, it's, it's a Luger. It's a Luger. Oh, I shot him. I'm sorry. I got... Oh, 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 oh
When shot is all it took to trigger the fall of a longtime sheriff and unravel the Tulsa County Sheriff's Office. My belief is when you drop the, the, uh, the pebble in the water, the ripple effect tends to go all the way out. And it's not a coincidence that we're right here in the middle and this story is still going on, what, a year later? It was April 2nd, 2015. Moments after Reserve Deputy Robert Bates shoots Eric Harris, deputies search his apartment and come up with nothing. We Red Rock? So who wrote the search warrant? I wrote the search warrant, but the uh, Boyden then went by and got the numbers. You said you got a search warrant, sir, and I'm giving you permission. So what's his exact address? And with his Bible on his dashboard and an old warrant in his hand, Andre Harris speaks to us for the first time. Custom, I told him he wanted to see him in his office. Now I turned around and left. If you just tell the honest truth, aren't you free? I can tell you that they were in a violent struggle with this guy. Bits and pieces of information filtered out through Shannon Clark, the public information officer for the sheriff's office at the time. There was a lot of things kept from me too. You, you have to remember there were there was like three or four different ball games going on. But this game was only in the first quarter. I was the fighter. He could start it, but I'd finish it. And uh, you can ask about anybody. Eight days after the shooting, the sheriff's office backs up Bates, saying mistaking your taser for a gun is a real thing. The explanation, not good enough for the district attorney, Bates is charged with second degree manslaughter. Mr. Bates, do you want to say anything? No, no, let, let, let. I have priorities in my life. And first is to my God. 18 days later, Sheriff Stanley Glantz speaks, sticking with the original play. His office did nothing wrong. Going to do anything he could, and he was going to change the public opinion any way he could to protect himself. Mr. Bates is going to be on trial for a homicide, and a lot of the truth will come out there. Days later, a 2009 report would blindside Glanz. The internal affairs investigation would highlight favoritism, falsification of records, and lack of training within the sheriff's office. The report focused on Robert Bates. There was just an unwritten rule. There were certain people that you held accountable and certain people you didn't hold accountable. Clark says Bates, who was a longtime friend and financial backer of Glanz, fell into one of those categories. When you're an elected official in an elected office, you're going to be loyal to those that help fund your position. If you're an average Joe, it's really hard to get a campaign finance. Clark, who had been defending the sheriff up to that point, was iced out and later fired. Weekly protests, 6,000 plus signatures, and a grand jury investigation resulted in two misdemeanor charges and a recommendation that he be removed from office. Holding on to his Bible and the belief that his brother's death served a purpose. The beginning and the ending is the exact same story. Andre says he's not walking away from the game, but finishing it. Maureen Wirtz, Tulsa's Channel 8. Within a year now, Bob Bates' <laughs> image has been all over the media. He's accused of second-degree manslaughter and the death of Eric Harris. Bates maintains he accidentally grabbed his gun instead of his taser. His attorney, Clark Brewster, sat down with us exclusively today to address the controversy surrounding a gun he had made. It was not going to be an exhibit. It was just making sure that they were on the same wavelength in the event they wanted to cross-examine the expert. Brewster says he ordered a gun just like the one Bates used for his experts to study. But when they received it, they needed to change the trigger because Bates's trigger was much easier to pull. When we asked why that was, do you know if he had changed that gun at all or anything? No, he bought the gun used, so we don't know its history. Brewster showed us the new gun is no longer on the evidence list and originally said he'd also show us the sample gun he had made. I thought about doing that and I, I talked to these guys about it. I, I just don't want to be in a position where we're bringing a gun out and explaining it. it it's part of my case, so I, I don't think it's fair to, to, to the prosecution. So, and Lauren. That's right. Channel 8 has some reporters in the courtroom right now. They're trying to determine and find out to see what that verdict actually is. Now, we've got the jury in there, and they're going to determine if Bob Bates is guilty or innocent of second-degree manslaughter. Now, in the closing statements today, the state and defense argued the burden of proof, which is if the innocent in incident is unlawful and if Eric Harris's death is a result of Bates disregarding the consequences. The state began by saying Bates was reckless when he used 
used a gun instead of a taser. Now, Maureen Mort's here, and she's going to tell us the verdict. Well, we just heard the verdict just moments ago. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, uh, Bob Bates was found guilty and sentenced to four years in prison. Now, again, we'll probably get some more details here. The whole courtroom was absolutely jam-packed. There were 11 deputies in there. Even the judge admonished everybody. Said no. He didn't know what the verdict was, but he didn't want any any reactions because then they would be held contempt of court. But again, we just found out that Bob Bates was found guilty and sentenced to four years in prison. But we'll keep you all updated, I'm sure, as people will come out and hopefully have some more updates for you for the rest of the six. Live in Tulsa County Courthouse, Maureen Wirtz, Tulsa Channel 8. All right, Ma Maureen, thanks very much. Uh, guilty. Um, Bob Bates here. We're going to have much more on that in the coming half hour. All right, let's take a look. Channel 8's Maureen Wirtz right now live at the courthouse with the latest on the Bates uh, sentencing. Maureen. Mark, well, just a few minutes ago, a judge sentenced Robert Bates to four years in prison. Now, this whole testimony has been going on for about four hours today. We heard from several witnesses on the defense kind of talking about Bates' health, his history, and kind of his the fact that they were hoping that he wouldn't be sentenced to prison. Now, you can see, obviously, things are still happening right now, but the judge kind of spoke to all of us in the courtroom and said that this case is very unusual. Even when trying to find similar cases, there weren't any that seemed to match. Even though the defense did give him 40 years of second degree manslaughter cases, but the judge kind of, I won't say, he, the judge kind of ignored that and said basically that this case is so unusual that this is why he sentenced him to four years. Now, the judge also did say that there was no sentence that's going to make anyone feel good about it and that Bates put himself in that position from his own decisions. Now, we're waiting for family members right now to come out here. Uh, family members for both Bates and the Harris family took the stand. Right now, what you're seeing is uh, Dan Smolin, he's the attorney for the Harris family. Behind there is Aiden Harris, and we'll be getting some sound with them and give you an update here at 6 o'clock. Live in the Tulsa County Courthouse, Maureen Wirtz, Tulsa's Channel 8. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, more tonight at 6 and also online at K2L.com. First brought to a 5 o'clock, former Tulsa County Reserve Deputy Robert Bates is headed for prison. A judge announcing a four-year sentence less than an hour ago. A jury convicted Bates of second-degree manslaughter last month in the death of Eric Harris. Channel 8's Maureen Wirtz was in the courtroom for today's, today's sentencing. Joined us now live with the latest. Maureen. Mark, things have calmed down quite a bit here at the Tulsa County Courthouse. All of the family members of the both Bates and Harris family have left, so things are a little bit quieter, but just the moments after that sentencing was handed down, things were extremely heated. Family members of the Bates were extremely frustrated, yelled at members of the media, but this sentencing went on for four hours today. Now, the judge, the defense called several witnesses to testify, arguing that because of Bates' health, his non-criminal history, and the fact that the shooting was an accident, he should have been sentenced to probation. Now, in the sentencing, the judge told Bates that he put himself in that position and there are consequences to decisions and that it was Bates' responsibility to know the weapon he was using. Now, we heard from Bates' wife, Charlotte, today who asked the judge for probation and also from Eric Harris's son, Aiden, who just recently graduated from high school, a moment he says he wanted to share with his father. I wanted my dad to watch me graduate from high school and when he wasn't there, it was, it was sad to know my dad wouldn't watch me but watch me from heaven. But it hurt. It was sad. Again, the judge sentenced to Bates to four years in a prison. Now, when we spoke to Bates' attorney, he did tell us he plans on appealing this sentence and the conviction. Now, when I asked the state about how long he'll be serving time in prison, they said they don't really know. It's up to the Department of Corrections to determine that. But at least um, they, they actually couldn't even really give me an, an, a, a specific amount, but he was sentenced for four years in prison. Now, we'll continue to update you on our website, K2L.com, and then we'll have more at 10 o'clock. Live at the Tulsa County Courthouse, Maureen Wirtz, Tulsa's Channel 8. Maureen, thanks. So you can read more about this case and the sentencing at K2L.com. To put my husband in prison for four years, my husband will die. And I want all of you to know that you're part of the responsibility for that. Robert Bates' wife lashes out at the news media after her husband is sentenced to four years in prison. This comes after a jury convicted the former reserve deputy of second degree manslaughter in the shooting death of Eric Harris. Channel 8's Maureen Wirtz was in court today and has more on the drama that unfolded outside the courtroom. was yelling or the shuffling of media around. So just walk up. Then I'll make you move over there. It was the drama that unfolded outside the courtroom that was front and center during the Bob Bates sentencing. Testimony went on for four hours, resulting in a four-year prison sentence for Bob Bates. Bates' wife Charlotte had some harsh words to say to the public 
and to the media. To put my husband in prison for four years, my husband will die. And I want all of you to know that you're part of the responsibility for that. The judge telling Bates he had to be held responsible for his actions, something Eric Harris's son Aiden agreed with. Yeah, I forgive him, Bob Bates. I forgive him, but there's still consequences for the actions. Even if people forgive me, I, and I did some, I still have consequences for him. But I, so I forgive Bob Bates. During the sentencing, the judge brought up the fact that Bates had called deputies the night before to see if there was anything going on, and that he, quote, found himself in that position from his own decisions on April 2nd, 2015. And after this shooting, Harris's son Aiden says it took him some time to forgive Bates, but... God will want me to forgive. He forgave me for all, my, all the things I've done, so I just thought I need to forgive him for what he's done. When we spoke with the state today, they told us that they were happy and relieved that this case is over, but most likely this won't be the last time that you'll see Bates in a courtroom. His attorney tells us that they plan to appeal both the sentence and the conviction. In the Tulsa County Courthouse, Maureen Wirtz, Tulsa's Channel 8. Judge also denied Bates' attorney's request for a new trial.